Welcome to Finding Proof, where we discuss all things early stage VC. We're your hosts, Thanasis and Jenny of the Proof Fund, and our goal is to get to know the best seed and early stage VCs out there. In this podcast, we're speaking with Safa Raschi, who is the founder and managing partner of Think Blast Ventures, a research-driven early-stage fund in Silicon Valley. Safa was an early Wall Street tech analyst and is an expert at identifying large-scale consumer trends early. So we were really interested in learning about his views on the future of tech in a post-COVID world. Safa, thanks for joining us today as we kick off the new year in 2021. Happy New Year, by the way. You study the trends and you are predicting the future. We are eager to ask you a lot of questions about that, but maybe to kick things off, tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you, Thanasis and Jenny. It's great to be here. I'm thrilled and honored that you've asked me to join this podcast. As you said, I've made it my career to fancy myself as a trend spotter, to think about what's going to happen. We're not always right, but I feel like this is a method that gets me going better than other ways that other people look do in investments. You asked me about my background. I started in investment banking as an analyst at Piper Jeffrey in 1997. And as you would recall, that was a period that dot-com was just beginning to burst up and bubble up. So we went up with the bubble and tried not to come down too hard with when the bubble burst. And I continued to cover internet stocks. That's really the formative years for, for me in terms of both watching what trends are happening, but also how to invest in companies and how to pick companies that could be winners in the future. And more importantly, what trends can be seen developing that others may ignore. The two important ones that I will mention that really helped me establish my name as an analyst were one, the growing importance at that time of search when nobody was really looking at search as a useful platform, let alone as a useful advertising platform. And we published a report called the Golden Search Report, which really said that this is going to be a multi-billion dollar market. Uh, And this was before Google was public even. This was when Google was probably about 20 to 30 people. So that's the kind of approach that we like to take to look at things as they are developing and when others might ignore it to see, is there really something in there or maybe others are right to ignore. The second trend that I was able to get on early and make some name for us as a firm was to look at the Chinese internet market. This was back in 2003 when there were really almost no internet companies in there and no one was taking the Chinese market seriously. I visited China, I looked at it and I realized that the potential of internet enabled platforms was actually significantly higher in China than in here. And combined with the fact that the Chinese economy was very vibrant, its people and entrepreneurs were very similar to the US. They weren't like other developing countries, very driven. So we could see that. And that really turned out to be a huge windfall for us. Again, we established our presence in China and were able to compete with bulge bracket firms like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, who had been in Hong Kong for years. But we were able to really compete well with them and cover Chinese companies. So that really led me to think about what do I do next after I've done these things? So by 2007, I realized that I pretty much had done what I wanted to do as an analyst in the public equities market and wanted to put those experiences and connections into use as a principal investor, frankly, to be able to invest into those ideas myself. And that's when I left Piper. I took some time to actually make my own investments to test the waters as an individual investor. I made about 30 investments, seven exits to public companies, and learned quite a bit during that process of investing as a principal investor in startups. So we started Think Plus in 2017 with really the same idea that I had established as an analyst, which was, let's be the thought leader in the space. That way you get the attention and you can compete with much larger firms. And the only way we could do that effectively is people thought us as the smart and thoughtful people who actually understand the space. And that has really worked for us. 
And to do that well, we obviously need to look into the trends and that's really how we are known to be trend watchers. So was there an initial spark that drew you to VC in particular? Well, there wasn't one moment only, Jenny, but there was a period when I was here in Silicon Valley. After about a year and a half at Piper in Minneapolis, I moved out here and helped establish their office. And I was visiting the companies, not only the public companies like Yahoo and eBay that we were covering, but also smaller companies because... In those times, there wasn't as much of a wall between the analysts and the bankers, so we would jointly go into companies. And I could see that this new group are the ones that are going to reshape the technology and the economy in the next few years. It's even with, with Google, when I met with Larry and Sergey before they were going public, I could see that there's something in them that was different from all the other search engines. They had a vision. So I got drawn to early stage companies because they would often have the vision that would be completely different from what I would see in the public markets. And I would, in fact, was one of the few analysts who would take our public investors, not just to see the public companies, but also to see private companies, because they would see the trends that will develop in the next four or five years. And that got me excited because I thought, look, the potential to work with someone who thinks that they have the best thing in the world, and they may or may not be right, but they have the vision to really unseat huge companies that's really exciting. So it's almost like becoming part of a revolution that we get to see every few years in technology. Talk to us a little more about the specific strategy for Think Plus and how you're approaching companies and how you win access to promising startups. So our approach in, at Think Plus is a little bit different from most early stage firms. Most early stage seed or series A investors, venture firms, really focus on the entrepreneurs. And that works well. You might have heard that we really invest in people because those are the ones, the entrepreneurs are the ones that make the company. We take a slightly different approach. We first start with the market and try to look at what problem is there that needs to be solved. What is what we call the big pain point that has the three attributes of depth, breadth, and frequency. That is a big pain point. It happens often and it impacts a large market, a large population. Then we look at the company and say, is this product or service really addressing that? And then we look at the entrepreneur and say, is she a visionary person? Can she really drive this company to be a large company, a multi-billion dollar company, not just solve a small problem? And if that's the case, and can she build a team? And if that's the case, then we go ahead with it. So we may end up with the same decision as others, but we start with the market and we start with the problem. And the reason is, A, as I mentioned, we are really driven by understanding the trends and trying to look at the market. And B, in our own studies, as well as the studies that have been published, the largest single reason the companies fail is product market fit. It isn't actually because the founders weren't good, but even with the good founders, when there isn't a good product market fit, it fails. I've seen many really visionary founders with brilliant technologies, but oftentimes there have been great solutions in search of a problem. So we try to not be enamored by either the vision of the entrepreneur or the technology and see, is there a problem that you're really solving? Are you a leader in financings or do you co-invest with other firms? And then what is it that founders find attractive in partnering with you? What really gets us connected with founders and we create a good symbiotic relationship is this understanding of the market and helping them strategically. We don't necessarily lead because we're a small fund. In some cases, we lead in terms of helping them find it, helping them set the deal terms, and we help them bring other client investors. But we don't necessarily take any board seat just because we're a lead. We do have board seats, but we don't insist on it. We just like to make sure that we're investing in a company that is solving potentially a big problem that has a good team and a good set of advisors. And we just keep close eyes on them to help them strategically. Tell us a little bit about the teen focus groups that you pioneered. Yeah, uh, that was really an interesting approach because it was counterintuitive in the beginning that you could get together just five or six kids or even adults and get something meaningful. But it really first illuminated when we had a conference at Laguna Beach and we had a bunch of young people come in to talk about social networking. And they talked about how at that point, MySpace was really becoming the 
big trend for them. And of course, MySpace became big enough that Rupert Murdoch bought it two weeks after a conference. So our investors were able to get some actual profit from it. But the, the genesis of why I thought team focus is good is that I thought you really have to talk with the customers, in this case, the, the teenagers, to understand what's in their mind. Stats by themselves and surveys don't tell the story. And I got to do this when I went to China first, and I wanted to know what drives Chinese teenagers. So I gathered a group of them, took them to Hagen das shop. That was the hottest thing at that time for these teenagers. And with my translator, I asked them, how do you spend your time? And that was probably the best research I was able to do ever in China, because I could see that the way they're spending their time is not materially different from the way the teenagers in the U.S. spend. It's just different apps and different things that they're buying. So the qualitative answers that you get from the teenagers is wonderful. I remember in one case, I was hosting a teen focus group at a Web 2.0 conference, and I asked one of them, why do you buy ringtones? At that time, ringtones were really popular. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And the way they answered was completely interesting because they wouldn't pay for any song on the internet. They would just download the songs for free. But ringtones actually meant that there's a value for them. And I asked them, when did you last pay for a song? And they looked at me like, why would you do that? It wasn't that they thought I'm, I'm just not shrewd enough not to do it. It's just that this is unnatural. So those kind of reactions you don't really get in the stats. And I think it's actually becoming more popular now, even beyond technology. But I think I can certainly claim that we established it and it became very popular. And I was able to do it at several conferences. I still totally believe in them. And I, I think that it, it really begins with the fact that you have to get close to your customers. Right. You have to ask them what they want. It's amazing what happens if you ask customers what they need, rather than try to just guess it or go through the click patterns to see what they want. Very true. Do you think one of those will happen in 2021? Another teen focus group? I think so, definitely. Yeah, I think not just a teen focus group, but I think I'm thinking about a focus group of customers to see how they're going to live in the post-COVID world. How much of the patterns that we develop will stay forever? Are they comfortable ordering lots of things at home? How are they going to socialize? And what things they find not quite right in this mode of socializing that maybe there are ways to fix those? What do you think are some of the biggest patterns there since we're on that topic? The thing that people know, but I think is underestimated, is the absolute ferocity and the depth of digital transformation that's happening. Everyone knows that we've been watching more Netflix, that we've been ordering online, and Amazon is going through the roof. But the fact that people became all of a sudden forced to try these things when in the past, they would just rather just go and shop on their own. And that caused many companies to actually build infrastructure to support even more. So it created a positive feedback loop. So we really do have an inflection point. I try not to use inflection point casually. I know we have often misused it, but I really feel that this is a point where we will look back and say, wow, things really took off in a massive way in there. So that's, I think, a major trend to look at. So what else can be delivered more effectively uh, using, not entirely on a digital format, some things can't be, but in a way that's aided by a digital format, where I think healthcare is certainly the biggest beneficiary in there. Fitness is certainly a biggest category in there. But even other areas that things that you could do around the house that maybe using a connection to, to an expert, for instance. So we would be looking at that. And then along with that, to support that, you really need much more robust logistics. So I think that's the single biggest area that I, I think is still room for a lot of investments in terms of both proper warehousing, last mile delivery, different methods of it. And we're looking at several companies in that space that are really very innovative. Do you want to drill down maybe in one area? I don't know if healthcare is the one or whatever. And talk a little more about why you think that this acceleration and online adoption is going to bring about a lot of changes. Yeah, let me do it on infrastructure and logistics, because I think healthcare has been talked about uh, a lot uh, recently. So if you think about the way things are delivered 
to our houses these days, it's really not that different from the way they were 10, 15 years ago. When FedEx established its presence 30, 40 years ago, it was with big distribution centers in big cities and then trucks going there and delivering items through the neighborhoods. And this is not really very efficient for e-commerce and a digital platform because it was designed for sending large packages into long distances very fast and cost effectively. What we have is almost the exact opposite of it, that we have smaller packages, tiny packages, going sometimes short distances, and we need them even faster in the same day. So you really need a completely different infrastructure for that. And combine that with the fact that not only I order something from Amazon, I order something from Home Depot, and maybe I also use DoorDash to order some food for this afternoon or later on. So you will have three or four people coming to my house. And that's highly inefficient. It doesn't make any sense. So many times at the same time, we actually had <laughs> exactly. that last week. There were like three different deliveries out of my home. <laughs> there you go. They get to know each other. <laughs> yeah. So it's not very efficient. So we are thinking of a future, a vision we have is a future where there are aggregators. In fact, we recently published a piece about this on things to look for in 2021. And we have a chart in there that really shows, think about an aggregator in there that gets the packages from the local distribution of Amazon, from the local distribution of Target or Home Depot or Costco, as well as from the restaurants and makes delivery, scheduled deliveries to our neighborhood once or twice a day. So that person will be able to actually deliver many packages. And because they're aggregated, one day I may not have anything, but my neighbor will probably have something from a local store. The next day I might have two or three things. So it makes it far more efficient. The second area is actually in much more advanced route optimization and package optimization. We have invested in a company called Boxbot and their technology enables the last mile distributor to actually put the packages in a way that they would be distributed in the most optimal way. So the packages are loaded into the cars and the best in the trucks in, in the most optimal way. This is something that UPS has been looking and Amazon has been looking for years, but they haven't been able to do that. So that massive sorting of the packages uh, is important. And the final piece is that we are seeing uh, dark kitchens. We're seeing basically, or, or cloud kitchens. So dark. We're seeing dark warehouse stores where there is a store, but there is really no storefront. It's simply just to deliver things. I think those things are going to be quite a bit more integrated into the local delivery system. So we're looking into all of the players in that space. I was interested in reading the newsletter that you sent just before the end of 2020, where you talked about these mega trends. And one of the Two that you mentioned, one was obviously this acceleration of online adoption, mm -hmm. but the other one was social unrest mm -hmm. and environmental issues. And I was surprised by that, talking about, you know, how tech is taking over the world, but you're mentioning some of the issues that arise. So I'd be curious about why you think those are going to happen and why you're thinking about them and what implications they might have. Happy to do that. This is an area that's really important for us, not just personally as a value, but actually as an investor, it's important for me because I think it's shaping the future of our economy. What we had before COVID, as many observers have noted, was really a increasing inequality, not just in income and in net worth or in their wealth, but as well as inequality in access to various things. Fortunately, access to digital services was a little bit more even in terms of the digital divide that wasn't as bad as we had all feared. But putting that aside, we were increasingly seeing two groups of population, those who have not only access to all the latest tools and live efficiently, where they can just put capital to work and get a benefit for that capital, and others who really didn't have access to those kind of wealth generation and didn't have access to those kind of education and job opportunities either. Now, what happened with COVID is that this massively accelerated. People like you and us didn't really get much impacted in terms of our business. We were knowledge workers. We could do our work from home. Many others were the same. And all of a sudden, we could see that what happens when there are interruptions like this, that if you are uh, a knowledge worker, if you can do your work on a computer, if you know how to work with technology, then you're fine. 
But if you are a clerk or if you're a janitor or if you have to deal with people uh, all the time and usher them from one place to another, then you are out of work. And you weren't able to transition out of that immediately. Many of our companies were able to transition from one service to another quickly. They were agile. They knew how to deal with these things. So it wasn't a problem that we, we lost those opportunities, but also that they couldn't transition. So my, my point is that we are seeing a, a further divide happening, and that divide is going to make the societies unstable unless we focus on re-education, retraining of almost a half a generation at least, if not a full generation, to bring them into the fold. Not only is the right thing as a society to do, we need it. Otherwise, the shrinking middle class will have very no customers and very few people to actually do the works that we need to do. So that's the imperative on that front. Uh, on the environmental front, we are already seeing the massive damage that we saw last year, especially from the fires, from the massive climate change records in many cases. So we need to really move fast on it. Otherwise, the cost for it eventually will be built into our businesses and the businesses that we invest in. So that's why I really see this also as a trend. It, it is not something that just is a societal issue. It's not something just for the next 50, 100 years. It's something that's going to impact us in the next 10 years. So do you want to tell us about one or two of your current portfolio companies? Happy to. One of our best performing companies that's become a unicorn is Apply Board. It's a company based in Canada. And it's an interesting story as to how we got to invest in them at the very early stage, a seed stage. The founder was introduced to me. He was new to Silicon Valley. He's still based in Canada, but he came here to look at the investors here. And when I looked at the company, I immediately realized that this is a major pain point that we hadn't really looked at before. And the pain point is, how do you connect international students to colleges and universities in the West, in the US and Canada and Europe? And to my surprise, it had the most inefficient system possible. There were about 20 to 30,000 small mom and pop agents who would work with these uh, students, get some fee from them, as well as a fee from the university, fax their documents. So it seemed like the classic case ripe for innovation. And it, it's really a marketplace. It was almost eBay 2.0 for students and education. So I helped the founder kind of think through this. Initially, he had the traction, like most companies do, with kind of, as they call it here, fake it until you make it. They were really not doing it much with technology, but people, and I told them, look, Martin, you have to build a technology. If you're going to raise large sums of money from Silicon Valley, you have to be a technology platform. Okay. So he followed that advice, and the company is now worth $1.3 billion. They have about six or 700 people around the world. And the revenues, I think, will exceed about a billion dollars gross revenues in 2021. And they're able to also go into other areas. And when you asked earlier about what I look in a founder, that's the kind of visionary I want. From the beginning, right. Martin wanted to build a large company that will solve bigger educational problems. And now he's already branching out into other areas. So clear long-term thinking is one area that I always look in a founder to see if that company really has a potential to be a large one or not. Exactly. And that's a great company to call out. One of the things that I liked about both Apply Board as well as a number of other companies that have been successful are the vision and the founders that they focus on building a big solution and solving a problem rather than trying to come up with a way that would give them a good economic margin. Mm -hmm. Economic margin is important. Profit is important. So I'm not talking about 2000 that don't focus on, but I'm a firm believer that they will only come if you focus on solving the problem. Just as Bezos has said, they focus on the customers and we have seen how much they can gain from it. Because we see companies who come in and say, look, we have come up with a way, for instance, to make a lot more money for doctors by cutting back on certain procedures that they have to do manually. And this platform can really work well. And the outcome is that they can get another 10% or more of their profits or similar businesses. Those are really, frankly, not things that we focus on. I try to, in fact, steer away from those. When a founder or a team is trying to really just focus initially by maximizing some financial metric, we need to see a vision of trying to solve a problem and not really even focusing on where the profit will come. Definitely. 
so moving on to our four standard question segment, we ask these as a way to get to know you more on a personal level. And we're really looking forward to hearing your answers. Question one is if you could have a magic wand and change or improve something about the VC industry, what would it be and why? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think the magic wand is the key here because I know it's not going to happen, but we have to wish. <laughs> We see VC industry is very interesting in that in some ways you could say it's very inefficient. You get economic benefits by showing some proficiency or skills or service that is better than your competitors. In investment banks, we certainly did that. Larger banks will say we have the big capital, we can do things, everyone knows us. We at Piper Jaffe said that we understand the markets well, our analysts understand the market well. So we were able to gain base on that. And if you go to any industry, whether financial or otherwise, usually that's the case. But in VC industry, the way that we win deals is to oversimplify it, either by luck or by having a name because we won something in the past that we were lucky. And I think that's really not fair to the founders. We have to be able to show we can deliver something better than our next competitor. And we never really get a chance to do that. And in fact, it, that, that was in a way that why we started Think Plus with the, with the approach that we have to be thought leaders. We have to provide at least the market knowledge, at least a strategic view. So if I were to able to change something, I would make the VC industry in such a way that they can actually prove they're providing something of value to the founders before they can invest. Now, by the same token, I think there is just way too much money in the market now. And we get way too many companies. We should almost have a system like when Germany, they have the usual college system as well as the apprenticeship. A lot of people will go through that and get into trade. There are a lot of good companies. There are a lot of good founders, but they're just not VC backable. They, they won't be large companies. So we should have a separate funding system for that. But right now, everyone gets to go and bid, and there's a lot of money, and they all get some funding, and I think that dilutes the system. So I wish it was a little bit more skill-based and much more selective. Got it. And question two is, if you weren't a VC and money wasn't a concern, what career would you have? (laughs) That's interesting, because there are maybe two answers for that. One is that I love gardening and I love cooking and I love arts too. can tell you love gardening by your backyard, which is amazing. <laughs> Thanks. So I think that's really enjoyable. And I have to say during the COVID period, as you were talking earlier about this kind of duality of lives, our life actually improved in some ways because I was able to spend more time in my garden at home and it impacted me more positively in some ways, which is, I feel ashamed sometimes. But on the other hand, intellectually, what I would be really interested in is to understand how human body works. As I would spend more time on it, if I were to do something else, I would be uh, not necessarily a physician, I would certainly have to study medicine, but also a biologist because the more I understand how our body, how our cells, how our, the enzymes work, is such a complex and well-designed system that's just mind-boggling. And I would have loved to be able to study that more than anything else to understand the way that our brain works, the way that our immune system works, the way that the cells communicate with each other, the way that the brain immediately tells me what to do and how these signals get transmitted. That's just fascinating, the way that it's orders of magnitude beyond what we could possibly build with our science. And there is something here that's functioning very well and we haven't designed it and it really malfunctions, but it's just amazing to me. So I would have loved to study human biology and medicine. I hear you on that. It is fascinating. That's an interesting answer. Question three is who is someone that you look up to and why? There are many people, certainly in the industry, as well as in politics elsewhere. But I have to say, as much as our politics are not necessarily the same, Bill Gates comes to mind. Because not only he has shown that he can be selfless in the sense that he's devoting a considerable amount of his time and energy, not just his wealth, to solving some big problems. When he didn't have to, he could have just gone and retired and enjoyed sitting at a villa in southern France. But he he has become passionate about world problems. And I I think that's really admirable. In in a way, that's the highest order we can get. And I understand that comes after you have other things that you wanted to achieve. 
achieve those things. So I think that's really great. And I admire that kind of thinking, that kind of devotion, and that kind of approach to problems. Early on, he would come out and say, look, it's great that you're trying to do all those things, but we first have to solve malaria for the basic needs of the problem. So I think he's a person who can really think globally, act locally, and is extremely uh, responsible and conscientious person and a very smart person, of course. So I have to say it's Bill Gates. That's a good one. And lastly, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The best piece of advice actually was from the CEO of Piper Jaffe, former CEO has since left. And I remember he said that the best thing to do and the best thing that helped him get through, he was a trader and got to be the top position, was to listen carefully. And I've really tried to incorporate that in my own dealings, both in business and in personal life. And I see the value of listening. And as I went through my career, especially investment banking, I saw that people who were the most successful and the smartest often listened a lot more than they talked. So I think the value of really listening, understanding, and listening not just to words, but listening to body language, just listening to other indications of how things are developing in a conversation or otherwise. And I think that's the single biggest advantage you can gain that you can actually something you can do it yourself and you can train yourself to do it. That's great advice. Words we can all live by for sure. Safa, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate learning all those insights and spotting the trends. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Anasas. Thanks, Jenny. It was a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed it. And follow us on Twitter at ProofVC or on our website at proof.vc. Thank you.